Yes. So uh, I can. Yes. I, I believe Dr. Helinda said we could shift to the main session. Recording okay. in progress. Uh, good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, yeah. uh, good evening, depending on which side you are. You are welcome to the high level yeah. meeting on saving life, livelihood, uh, uh, achieving high level equitable COVID 19 vaccination coverage in the African Union uh, member state. Uh, to all participants, I welcome you to this uh, uh, very important meeting and a timely one for that matter. Uh, in order for us to have a, a, a engaging and interesting session, I will kindly request that you all mute your microphone unless you are the one uh, uh, talking. The meeting will be for one hour, 30 minutes and will be composed of two sessions. We are going to have a session of welcome remarks by our respective co-host which will be followed by a keynote address by uh, Her Excellency President Johnson Salif. We, we will have a session of experience sharing with regards to country engagement, which will be followed by a panel discussion made up of our invited guests. The session will be translated in, into all the AU working languages. Kindly press on the icon uh, that says interpretation to allow you to follow the meeting in the language that you are most conversant with. Once again, thank you and welcome to this important meeting. Let me hand, uh, hand over to the uh, uh, US um, 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 ambassador in, and, uh, to the African Union to, uh, to make her presentation. Thank you, over to you, Your Excellency. Your Excellency, you are muted. You can take the floor. Uh, um, the host, can you please unmute? Um, the, uh, it only. Thank you, Doctor Mohammed. I believe that Ambassador Le Pen is within the audience uh, uh, connection, not the panelist connection. Yeah, I'm, I'm, now, I'm now on. I'm now with the, joining the panelists. So thank you for that. Sorry. But um, what can we say? This is, um, right, this is the example of the partnership, the working together. So thank you for that. Um, let me first um, acknowledge Your Excellency, President Sirleaf Johnson, Dr. Nakangasong, and Under Secretary General Stoyikovic. Good afternoon to everyone here in Addis and greetings to those joining virtually from across the continent and around the world. I'd like to acknowledge our partners from the Africa CDC team here at the African Union and the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Society. And global leaders to map out a global plan for fighting COVID-19. Today, we bring that conversation to our local context. The COVID-19 virus has challenged us on every front in seemingly every way. We've all been impacted, some more than others. And nowhere is this more true than in Africa. The virus is still spreading and leaving many parts of the world susceptible and unvaccinated. It's unacceptable, it's also dangerous to our lives and our livelihoods. As we all know too well, no one country or organization can alone stop the pandemic. Together with our partners at the AU and across the continent, the United States is committed to leading the global response to the COVID-19 pandemic, becoming an arsenal of vaccines for the world and helping every country build back better. As President Biden has made clear, the United States supports 
multilateral approaches, and will work as a partner to address global challenges. We are with you. Since joining COVAX in January of this year, the United States has pledged $4 billion to improve equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines across the globe. We're re-engaging the World Health Organization, boosting vaccine confidence, supporting global distribution of safe and effective vaccines, expanding international vaccine manufacturing capabilities, and working to reform the global health security architecture. Last night, President Biden committed another 500 million doses for low and lower to middle income countries around the globe. This follows an earlier commitment of 500 million doses, bringing the total doses committed by the United States to over 1.1 billion. Together with our G7 Plus partners, we've committed to provide more than 2 billion vaccines for the world, a number that will continue to rise until the pandemic has ended. Furthermore, we're working with other kinds of international partners, investment entities, pharmaceutical companies, manufacturers, to create the kind of global vaccine production and manufacturing capacity that will not only help the world beat this pandemic, but prepare us for future threats. At yesterday's summit, President Biden asked for world leaders to commit to specific benchmarks for ending the pandemic. They'll measure and report on their progress toward this goal. The United States and other countries committed to vaccinating 70% of the world by 2022 and to focus on vaccine delivery and on expanding vaccine manufacturing supply around the world. We committed to a stronger COVID-19 response, including expansion, expanding oxygen availability, more testing, and providing access to therapeutics and PPE. We vowed to support sustainable financing for global health security, to prepare political leadership for emerging biological threats, and to expand manufacturing and research and development to prepare for future pandemics. We know that to end this virus, to ensure it doesn't pose a threat to people anywhere, we need to confront it everywhere. And we need to take this approach on both the macro and the micro level. It will take more than a meeting of heads of state to make the necessary progress. It takes the work that our partners here at the community level are doing day in, day out, sharing experiences and best practices. Today, we'll talk about how we can engage community leaders across the continent to take part in saving lives and saving livelihoods. Our hope, our intent, is that today's event is a catalyst for important discussions about this issue affecting all of us. With many thanks, I'll turn the floor over to Itande Kakoma, our co-host and the IFRC permanent uh, representative to the African Union. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Le Pen, for these opening remarks. Your Excellencies, distinguished panelists and audience members, on behalf of the International Federation, the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, IFRC, allow me to also extend a warm welcome to you today and express appreciation for the leadership and cooperation we enjoy with the African Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the U.S. Mission to the African Union for convening this important discussion today. The IFRC is the world's largest humanitarian network, comprised of 192 members globally. Now, with a unique auxiliary status, particularly uh, our African national societies across the continent work hand in hand with their respective ministries of health and have played a critical role in the fight against COVID-19. We will hear from a distinguished select group of representatives across the continent, representing national societies and leaders in community health work today in more detail shortly. Now, I must say that it is a priority for the IFRC to support African national societies in scaling up their responses to COVID-19 and to support the vaccination rollout, as well as to respond to the emergence of new strains and resurgence of the virus. IFRC also acknowledges the need to join hands in disseminating more credible information so that vaccines can be administered throughout the continent to boost confidence in vaccine uptake and to address the critical issue of vaccine hesitancy. Finally, 
allow me to reiterate the global commitments as expressed just yesterday by the Secretary General of the IFRC during the COVID-19 global summit convened by President Biden. As he stated, the IFRC is committed to ending the pandemic and building stronger health security in partnership with many of those present here today. Furthermore, the IFRC committed through the Secretary General's affirmations yesterday to being a founding partner in the establishment of a Global Health Threats Council and the financing mechanism needed so our collective preparation and response is funded. Furthermore, the IFRC commits to delivering vaccines quickly and fairly and to strengthen national health systems through greater investment in local actors, delivery mechanisms and capacity, and furthermore, commits to build trust and confidence in vaccine safety and efficacy through scaling up community engagement and accountability. Now, I wish all of us a successful deliberation today for this crucial gathering. And as Ambassador Le Pen indicated, as the beginning of a conversation, we hope to deepen and strengthen moving forward. With that, allow me to give the floor to Dr. John Gengasong, Director of the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. John, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Itunde uh, Kakuma, for your very uh, kind words and for your commitment uh, working with your organization to advance uh, the fight against COVID-19 on the continent. Let me also recognize uh, 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 Nina Stokovic and Ambassador Lapen and use this opportunity to congratulate Ambassador Lapen for uh, the wonderful summit yesterday for that uh, President Biden uh, hosted. I think that is the kind of leadership that we have been wanting to see uh, from um, the United States. The world has always been in a good place in terms of health security when the United States leads, uh, including the, the work they did 20 years ago to launch PEPFAR. We hope that this the meeting yesterday will transform and into some actions similar to the a game-changing efforts of PEPFAR. Let me then also recognize Her Excellency Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who gave a really insightful uh, remarks yesterday. And to use this opportunity, Excellency, to really congratulate you for your championship in advancing the health security, not just through the, um, the panel work that you are co-chairing, but your own personal commitment to uh, advancing public health and, and global health security. The, the world we live in today, and specifically the region we are in, is facing an unprecedented uh, times with this pandemic. The pandemic in Africa is, un, is uh, uh, unprecedented, but the trajectory is uncertain. And that is what worries me a lot. Uh, it's unpredictable because of the really limited uh, access to vaccines. And we, uh, I would like to also acknowledge and thank uh, President Biden for <clears throat> making the additional commitment of 500 million doses of vaccines. As we speak today, Excellency, uh, Africa has uh, vaccinated about 4% of its population fully. And if we want to get to at least 70% of the population vaccinated by next year, as stated yesterday in, at the summit by President Biden, we have a work cut for us. Uh, but we remain optimistic that we can get there if we express deliberately solidarity and cooperation and corporate cooperation that um, has enabled us previously to solve bigger problems. The world knows how to do this. Uh, in 2001 and, or 2002, uh, the late Kofi Annan, who was the then UN Secretary General, step up in front of head of states in Abuja and call for the establishment of the Global Fund. The Global Fund, in my view, and in my three decades of public health, is the greatest expression of solidarity and cooperation uh, to fight infectious diseases in the history of, uh, our, uh, uh, of public health and in the history of maybe modern uh, humankind. So I believe we can do that if we do that together, if we do that in the spirit of what the kind of uh, a leadership that uh, uh, Kofi Annan taught us to stand up together, hold our, our hands together to solve common problems. 
let there be no doubt, we are in this pandemic together. Whether you live in the global north or global south, we are in together. And the best way to come out of this pandemic is to come out of it together. And to come out of it quickly, we need to vaccinate quickly. So I'm very pleased with the partnerships that are developing with Africa CDC and the International Federation of Red Cross. I'm very pleased with the partnerships that Africa CDC has developed with the United States government to expand vaccines and other partners, including COVAX. Uh, to uh, roll out vaccines on the continent, we have argued that we need two things. We need vaccines and we need vaccinations. In order to expand our vaccination programs, we really need to engage the community. Community healthcare workers are a critical role and will continue to be a critical role in the fight against this pandemic. Let there be no doubt, we need testing. We need to test at scale and we need to decentralize testing and put it in the hands of our community healthcare workers. Africa CDC, hopefully in working with all our partners in the coming weeks, we'll be launching a PAC 2.0. PAC 2.0 will be aimed at scaling up antigen testing such that we continue to use public health measures to drive the response to get this pandemic out of our way. We are only at, as I mentioned earlier, 4% vaccination rate, which means we have to continue to advance basic public health tools that are in our disposition, including a rapid antigen test scale up enhanced community at, at, at work so that we can know exactly where the hotspots of this virus has flush it out while waiting for vaccine uh, coverage to increase. Over the course of the last 18 months, uh, under the leadership of a very strong Africa CDC team, Helinda and Mohammed, we are able to deploy over 18,000 community healthcare workers in 28 countries. These individuals were able to conduct about 2.6 million household visits and conducted 1.6 million contacts to identify those who are infected and their contacts. The community healthcare workers, I'm sure Her Excellency Elliot Johnson Sally will comment on this, is the nexus for our universal health coverage and health security. So we believe that if we do it right now and do it collectively uh, and do it in a way that can be sustained, then we can use it to fight this current pandemic and prepare ourselves for subsequent pandemics or disease outbreaks. I really look forward to enhancing our partnership and working with the International Federation of Red Cross, the US government, as well as uh, the uh, Her Her Excellency uh, Johnson's uh, foundation. I thank you for the opportunity to contribute. It turned it, can I get, get, okay. Yes, we uh, give the floor to Her Excellency, uh, Madam Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, former president of the Republic of Liberia. Thank you, Itunde. Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Africa's experience with the COVID-19 pandemic demonstrates now more than ever that we need to work together more creatively, more decisively, building a healthier and safer world is a collective responsibility. The leadership demonstrated by the African Union in Africa CDC with Dr. John Angerson is laudable and leads us in the right direction. And yet, greater commitments, investments, and sustained support from African Union member states will be required to ensure Africa's health security. We need stronger alignments of continental and national strategies. We need increased community engagements. We need local ownership of the health problems 
and the health solutions. And we need to optimize our collective efforts by aligning investments, providing coordinated technical support, and holding ourselves accountable. Responding to the Ebola epidemic in 2014, I learned very well how a community-based response was not only successful in curbing and ending the outbreak, but also in providing vital support to tackling other infection, infectious diseases. I am proud that our community health workers, including the Liberia Red Cross Society, among others, were at the forefront of creating awareness and providing services to prevent this further spread of the disease. I'm truly encouraged to see the same principles being included in the Africa CDC's PACT supported community health workers COVID-19 response across 27 African Union member states. Allow me to draw from the Liberian experience to also confirm that community health workers can play crucial roles in the following. Conducting community disease surveillance, including contact tracing and referring patients for testing, all of which are critical in a COVID-19 response. Maintaining life-saving health services during a crisis, including vaccine rollout. Building community level confidence in health solutions, as well as fighting against hesitancy and misinformation. And offering psychosocial support to families that have been impacted by death or illness from an outbreak. It has been said that crises offer opportunities that should not be wasted. The same is true of this deadly pandemic. As we work to end it, let us use the opportunity to build more resilient health systems so that we do not wait for the next pandemic to strike before we respond, but that we give ourselves and our children a chance to stop the emergency long before it becomes a pandemic to destroy lives and livelihoods. This means empowering the community health workers, and it means investing in the frontline health workers, those closest to the community and closest to the health emergency. Integrated, well-trained and supervised community health workers can support the immediate COVID-19 response efforts, including vaccination rollouts, in remote and vulnerable communities, helping to establish pandemic preparedness and mechanisms, setting countries on a path to resilience against future health threats, and representing a small, a smart investment to sustainably protecting lives and preventing livelihoods and preserving livelihoods. I applaud the efforts of President Joe Biden for convening the timely summit yesterday on COVID-19. I all want to thank our own African Union leader, President Sarah Ramaphosa, our continent's response champion, Dr. John Anderson, who is here with us today, and the work he continues to do to bring credibility to Africa CDC. We applaud him for the leadership and effort to enable Africa's response. Collective leadership is indeed required if we are to find global solutions to global partners. This is why we also applaud and are pleased to see the Under Secretary General of the IFRC, Nina Strokovic, and in particular, leaders from Africa, Red Cross and Red Crescent National Societies, 
here with us today. Their experience in leadership on the ground is part and parcel of finding durable solutions through local actions. The presence also of international partners who have stood with us in Africa and elsewhere across the world, from Gavi, WHO, UNICEF, and foundations such as MasterCard and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation are critical to ensuring that our response is a coordinated collective and concerted effort. On this specific event focus on Africa, it is important to stress that while we gather to collectively think about efforts towards our response on the African continent, we must equally remind everyone that addressing vaccine inequity is critically important because not doing so threatens global security and solidarity and partnerships as we have known them. Vaccine inequity, is putting many lives and livelihoods in danger and is ris risking leaving too many behind while threatening to reverse the gains made in building trusting global partnerships. The upcoming COP26 and the travel restrictions that most Africans are likely to face because of the politics on vaccines means crucial voices, including those who represent local realities may be excluded in shaping global actions on the climate. Excellencies, so far, we've had a lot of talking, a lot of meetings, a lot of fora. It is time to convert good words and intentions into actions. We therefore call on governments, private sector, civil society, and partners to invest in community-based health delivery platforms and systems. We call upon our own governments, partners, and vaccine manufacturers to remove all obstacles and ensure that everyone has access to COVID-19 vaccines without any further delays. Let us rise to the moment. We thank the United States for doing that on yesterday. Let us make history together. Let us collectively and decisively work to save lives and livelihoods. I thank you all for your work and your contribution to make this a better world. Thank you. Your Excellency, uh, thank you very much uh, for such an aspirational opening statement and for, uh, for a call for action. Good afternoon, Your Excellency's colleagues. Uh, my name is Nena Stojilković and I'm the IFRC Under Secretary General for Global Relationships and Humanitarian Diplomacy. It is my pleasure uh, to welcome you all uh, to our country-focused panel discussion on the challenges, opportunities, and lessons learned from the community-level response to the COVID-19 pandemic. We will hear from ministries of health and Red Cross, Red Cross and National Societies uh, from six, uh, actually five countries. But pandemics start and end at community level. It is through empowered and engaged communities and the work of community health workers and volunteers that we will find a way out of COVID-19 pandemic and prevent the next one. Since the onset of this pandemic, IFRC's African national societies in their position as auxiliary to their respective governments have played a critical role in the fight against COVID-19. They have reached more than 300 million people across the continent with messaging to prevent the spread of the virus and efforts to build trust and confidence in vaccine safety and efficacy through community engagement and accountability activities, particularly in hard to reach areas. They have also been active in addressing the socioeconomic impacts of COVID-19 by supporting more than 80 million people with cash transfers to meet basic needs and food assistance. I would like now to turn uh, to our esteemed uh, panel. And I have uh, one question for all of my five uh, panelists. Um, I would like to get uh, the panelists uh, ready and uh, we'll do the introduction as they come uh, to speak. 
The question is, what are the key challenges and opportunities in ensuring effective engagement of community health workers and community-based volunteers in response to the COVID-19 pandemic? And I would appreciate it if as part of your response, you can also please share with us the most important lesson learned from your country level experience. I would like to turn uh, to my first panelist, Dr. Asha Mohammed, uh, Se Secretary General of Kenyan Red Cross. Uh, Dr. Asha, it's a great pleasure to have you on this panel. Please uh, start with responding to this question. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much, Nina. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, it's indeed a pleasure and an honor to be part of this um, very important discussion. Uh, and I would like to share from the experience of the Kenya Red Cross, as you mentioned, uh, working very closely with uh, national and local government levels, but also with other stakeholders as auxiliary. Uh, it has been uh, a pleasure, but uh, as you said as well, yes, there are challenges and the opportunities and lessons learned to be shared. If I start with the challenges, I would say that um, uh, a big issue is coordination. And I know this is um, maybe uh, a word that we are always uh, talking about and reflecting on. And uh, in this case, uh, uh, I don't even mean coordination at the national level. And I'm looking at coordination even at the local level, where uh, it is um, an area that uh, uh, is challenging because then we also have many actors on the ground that are working in the various communities. And therefore, sometimes uh, we find there are siloed approaches by different organizations. And therefore, uh, the issue of how do we optimize uh, the inputs coming from the different partners and therefore a good uh, level of local coordination is, is needed uh, in, in this response. The other issue, of course, is vertical approach uh, that uh, is being taken in terms of responding to COVID-19. And what I mean by this is that uh, today we are all talking about COVID-19, we are talking about COVID-19 vaccination, but it is the same populations that are affected by many other emergencies and many other issues. And therefore, how do we ensure that when we are Responding to COVID-19, we are actually looking at the population that is affected in totality. Uh, food insecurity, we are talking about drought being an issue today in our country and in the Horn of Africa in particular. Um, what support are these communities going to get in terms of the food security? Food will be the first priority. And so when you're trying to get the community to actually uh, uptake uh, COVID vaccination and they do not have food, to eat, then uh, this is a big challenge. So I think the vertical uh, nature of our response sometimes uh, is actually working against us because then the priorities uh, need to be uh, looked at in a more holistic way and communities being supported. Uh, I would say another challenge that we have um, also uh, encountered is that uh, the medicalized approach for COVID-19 and COVID-19 vaccination is also a bit of a challenge in the sense that we are not giving enough uh, resources and enough uh, time to be able to actually support communities in some of the very essential uh, ingredients to actually uh, in increase on the COVID-19 vaccination and other measures, uh, the IPC measures. And that is because we are not building enough uh, trust within communities. Uh, we are just talking about, yes, we have identified very many sites, we have so many uh, vials of vaccines and you know we, are, we have so many healthcare workers ready to vaccinate but there's much more that needs to be done at the local level much more that needs to be done at the community level to build this trust to be able to encourage and motivate people actually to make use of these facilities that are being set up so a medicalized approach uh, needs to be balanced with uh, you know a very very robust and very intense uh, community engagement and community dialogue to ensure that people can trust that yes, they can come and get uh, vaccinated because we know uh, in Kenya and I'm sure in many of the other African countries, the myths and misconceptions that are there are many. And not only from uh, you know community level people, but we find that even uh, with the professionals and people who have a lot of information on COVID-19, because again, there's too much information at the same time and some people will even hesitate to get vaccinated because they now know that there are many other options and may be waiting for something that will take very long and risk their lives. Maybe Nena also to just talk about um, 
the question of stigmatization. Uh, and this is an experience we have seen in, in Kenya, and I can say from the Kenya Red Cross perspective, that sometimes even uh, the community health volunteers uh, face stigma when they are out there in the community trying to educate, trying to inform, trying to encourage that they themselves then become branded as, you know, uh, individuals that are the ambassadors of uh, COVID-19 and this kind of issue. So we need to also then ensure that uh, the issue of stigma uh, it reminds us of the HIV response and uh, very clearly then that sometimes actually the response to COVID-19 seems to mirror and to remind us of when we were you know, starting uh, on this. Uh, very quickly then on what are the opportunities? Uh, what we see uh, from our perspective as well is that we have many community health workers, many community health volunteers uh, in all our communities. This is a very big resource. How do we utilize this resource? to ensure that we can reach every corner of our countries, that we can reach every community with information, with the right messaging, and also then ensure that we can get vaccines to every corner. Uh, again, as I talk about emergencies and disasters, this is also an opportunity that when we are responding to some of these emergencies, how do we integrate this so that the response can ride onto platforms that are created for response to other issues. Uh, another opportunity, of course, is the fact that uh, many of the community health workers and community health volunteers have been trained uh, on many issues. There has been a lot of work, a lot of programs. In Kenya, we have all been rallying around the universal health coverage agenda uh, set by the government and also the Minister of Health has been in the forefront. And the Kenya Red Cross has been working closely with the Minister of Health in ensuring that as many community health volunteers as possible are uh, trained in the different communities. So we have thousands and thousands of community health volunteers, a very big resource, a resource that is already well enlightened and all they need is some little support to ensure that they get actually then the correct messaging around COVID-19, COVID-19 vaccination. And this is a resource that we need to fully utilize for us to reach communities. Finally, um, and then, uh, then my last one is on the lessons learned. And again, I'll go back to something I mentioned earlier. And the biggest for me is really community trust. Without this, then all our big plans, all our big ideas will not get us to where we want. And therefore it's important that um, uh, we work with, especially those people at the lowest level, and that is the community, to ensure then that we build trust amongst our communities to ensure then that when we come with these services, when we want them to go out and access these services, then there is enough trust for them to believe that yes, we are being asked to do something that we know is going to benefit us and is going to benefit the community. So I'll stop here, Nena, and uh, back to you. And again, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Asha. I would like now to call on uh, the Secretary General of Egyptian uh, Red Crescent, Dr. Rami El Nazer. Uh, Dr. Rami, I hope that uh, you were able to connect and would like to ask you to respond to the same question, please. Dr. Rami? It is possible that Dr. Rami, who we know has joined uh, in, uh, has an issue with, uh, with the connection. We'll try to call on him a bit later. Uh, now, if I may, I would like to call on our colleague from Malawi Red Cross, uh, Ms. Priska uh, Shisala, Director of Programs and Development. Uh, Priska, please, can you please uh, respond to my question? Uh, hello, thanks very much, Your Excellency, and all protocols observed. I would like to indeed uh, share experiences from Malawi Red Cross Society in as well as uh, our engagement in um, addressing COVID-19 pand pandemic is concerned. Um, to begin with, uh, we have looked at, uh, or we have faced a number of challenges uh, in our work around COVID-19. Um, interventions uh we'll start uh, sharing the um religious beliefs as part of um factors that have affected our work we have noted that uh, there are some religions um that bar 
the members from participating in uh, COVID-19 interventions, including the vaccine itself. Uh, and then reference is also made to um, their teachings. Uh, we, we, we will give an example of um, provision of uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccination cards being linked to what is written in the Bible, the, the symbol of 666. And for such uh, communities that have these kind of um, religion religious teachings that are deep rooted, uh, we have noted that it has been a challenge for our volunteers to penetrate, to provide the right messages um, uh, on COVID-19. And at the times they've even faced uh, harassment. And also for Malawi, I would want to share that uh, when COVID-19 um, was being registered in Malawi, we were going into a poll. So there was already a, a, a challenge in terms of the political atmosphere where uh, politicians were giving uh, contrary messages about the existence of the, um, the virus itself, uh, claiming that COVID-19 pandemic is not yet in Malawi, just to create a platform where um, people could cloud, come together so that they deliver whatever they wanted to deliver, whether it's messages about their political agendas or whatsoever. So also this was also um, going contrary to what our volunteers, our community health workers are promoting in terms of the various COVID-19 preventive measures of which uh, social distancing being uh, one of that. And again, we also looked at issues of um, social um, economic challenges affecting the work of our volunteers. We have noted that uh, at times some um, community members might uh, help their relatives to get into the country through um, uncharted routes. And uh, at times the people that are coming from outside Malawi might come from uh, high risk COVID-19 countries. So already that is a risk for transmission of the virus itself. But because they are using uncharted routes, it is also difficult for our community um, health workers as well as our volunteers to trace such kind of uh, people that come uh, in country. And again, that is also hindering the work uh, of our volunteers and our communities. Even the issue of uh, social stigma as reported by our colleague from um, Kenyan Red Cross is also an issue in Malawi where people hide uh, symptoms for fear of uh, stigma, thereby putting at risk the lives of the volunteers and the community workers that they work with. Yeah, so I think this is what we would want to share in terms of some of the challenges that our community uh, health workers and volunteers face. However, we would also want to say we've also noted or we've also seen uh, the opportunities that are there in our work around uh, community engagement. Uh, for instance, um, the availability of a pool of volunteers across the country. That is an opportunity for us because uh, usually the community uh, workers from the government are not adequate enough to reach everywhere else. And us as Malawi Red Cross in our auxiliary role, we have at least proven to be uh, a readily available resource in terms of uh, providing the right messages. So working with uh, government, who are the, like the primary generators of um, harmonized messages around COVID-19 being a new um, disease. So we've worked hand in hand with various stakeholders, especially the government, to make sure that we provide harmonized information, we utilize the, uh, available, the later available resource of our volunteers in the communities to make sure that everyone else uh, is, is reached. So uh, that has been, uh, we've seen that as an opportunity. And again, in our work um, around COVID-19, working with various stakeholders, we have also seen an opportunity in that um, we have been able to gain more trust from community members in as far as uh, our work is concerned. And of course, we cannot overemphasize the growth in terms of collaboration with the various uh, stakeholders, partners, the communities, the religious leaders and the like. And again, we would also want to just share to say, I think we've learned quite a lot in our work around COVID-19, but uh, um, the key one that we would want to share is uh, the fact that we've noted that um, for us to address COVID-19 pandemic, we need to join hands. There's no way we can work in isolation. We need to take everyone else on board. Let's not leave anyone behind. 
Uh, for example, when we were working at the very beginning, we noted resistance in terms of um, the community members to receive the messages from COVID-19, including the vaccine itself. So what we did was to uh, work hand in hand to have constant dialogue with uh, various uh, influential groups in the communities. So we are talking about church leaders, we're talking about local leaders in the community. So like bringing everyone else together. So our community, our, our, our Red Cross volunteers, the community health workers, the chiefs, the church leaders working together, penetrating to those people that matter in the community, those people that influence behavior in the communities, so that they also have the right information on COVID-19, and then the very same information is passed to the rest of uh, the community members. And this, we've seen it working, and the, uh, a very good example is at least reduced hesitancy to uh, receiving uh, the, the vaccine itself. So we've really seen that utilization of um, different influential groups in uh, our work on COVID-19 is really vital in influencing behavior change, in promoting uptake of the messages, and even the uptake of the vaccine itself. Uh, thank, Liska, you very thank you much. very much. Nina, I would yes. like to stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. We still have to, to hear from three more colleagues. Uh, and thank you for drawing on some similarities uh, with the um, situation in, in Kenya that Dr. Rasha um, walked us through. Really appreciate it. Now we, uh, it looks like we have Dr. Ami uh, back with us, uh, although you're showing a different name there, but uh, Secretary General of Egyptian Red Crescent, please go ahead, same question to you. What is Egyptian Red Crescent experience? Uh, thanks a lot uh, for uh, for you and also for the African Union. Uh, good afternoon, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, viewing this meeting from the Red Cross and Red Crescent Family State of the African Union and the African Center of Disease Control and Prevention members. It's a great honor for me today to join you and share with you the key challenges, opportunities, and the main lesson learned for the humanitarian efforts of the Egyptian Red Crescent in Egypt in response to reduce the spread of COVID-19 pandemic nationwide in Egypt and the COVID-19 vaccination as well. Being exposed to the COVID-19 pandemic without adequate studies of the previous experience in dealing with epidemic was very challenging. Although the global direction of promoting vaccination for all and the action taken by the local authority at the country level to open registration for vaccination without total coverage of all doses that can be absorbed all the registered people. In addition to the delay in receiving the first dose of the vaccine for more than two months, therefore some communities lost their interest of getting their vaccine. And this is the result of unfair and unequitable access and distribution for vaccination among the middle and the low income countries. Dear guests, COVID-19 pandemic also came with many opportunity, adding to what had mentioned by my colleagues as a digitalization and the other. Egyptian Red Crescent with enthusiastic, with the trust that received from the community member nationwide. The community engagement and the other recruitment of more than 8,000 volunteers at the early beginning of the pandemic positioned the national society to be preferred choice of the community member in a term of receiving information about the pandemic and receiving other humanitarian intervention that mitigate the crisis. Finally, as we all invest together and we have the same RCRC mandate and the spirit, we could have different approach and experience in response to the COVID-19. And I believe that the main lesson learned for us that we should demonstrate the impact of the national society response to COVID-19 through investing more in the human resource. I mean that the volunteer that we have and the continuous community engagement. Thank you so much for your attention and I wish a good day for all of you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Amit, thank you very much for such a concise, um, excellent um, overview of uh, the Egyptian Red Crescent experience. I would like now to call on uh, Mr. Ola Svordvia, 
Director National Community Health Program in Liberia Ministry of Health. Mr. Villa, thank you. please. Thank you thank very you. much for being with us today. Thank, thank you, you. please go ahead. Your Excellencies, Honorable Delegates, let me firstly express my deepest happiness to be part of this panel, especially in the presence of my former president, Ernie Johnson Salif, who have championed the cause of community health in Liberia. And I remember I was in the county in Riverji when she launched this program. Madam President, I'm pleased to let you know that I am the current director of the National Community Health Program in Liberia. It is an honor to be with you. On March, 19, on March 16, 2020, Liberia announced its first case of COVID-19. This announcement took the nation from a preparedness to response phase. Since then, Liberia, like other nations, had continued to experience challenges regardless of the efforts being made to reduce the daily transmission of the disease. Currently, as of Monday, September 19, 2021, we have reported a total of 5,787 confirmed cases, 17 active cases being monitored in five of the 15 counties with zero new cases reported on the day. There, there has been a total of 283 deaths with 64 occurring in treatment facility, 117 in health facility, and 47 in the communities. There is 5,487 recoveries, while a total of 87 contacts are currently on a follow-up. A total of 140,519 laboratory tests have been done, and there is a total of 132,838 doses of COVID-19 vaccine administered with AstraZeneca accounting for 23% and GNG 77% thus far. Earlier this year, the African CDC launched the Partnership for Accelerating COVID-19 Testing Initiative, which highlighted the need for coordination, collaboration, cooperation, and communication among member states to minimize transmission, limit deaths, and mitigate harm resulting from COVID-19. I'm pleased to inform you all that Liberia fully benefited from that phase, from the phase one of the initiative that saw the training of the training and supporting of 200 CHVs, 16 community health supervisors, and five county health supervisors in Montserrat County for a period of three months, May to July 2021. The project was managed by Action A Liberia and implemented by the Montserrat County Health Team. The end of project cumulative data shows that 442,942 households were visited, 717 COVID-19 contacts identified and monitored, 343 active case search, and 222 suspected cases were linked to testing, while 12,325 community members were mobilized for vaccination. These interventions truly highlight the key role community health worker plays in the fight against the pandemic. While the rest of the world has embarked on widespread vaccination of its population, only 4% of Africa population is vaccinated compared to 60 to 70% in some high income nations. Liberia has received 192,000 doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine and 302,399 doses of the J&J &J vaccine. But as of September 20, 2021, only 2.9% of the Liberian population has been vaccinated. These numbers greatly differ across country, counties as those with rural and remote communities have less access and low uptake of, as compared to those of semi-urban communities. However, we have ensured that 67% of all community health workers receive their first dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine and actively, there's currently on, activity currently on, on a way to ensure that all community health workers and other community members are mobilized for vaccination in coming days. Notwithstanding, there are challenges 
to include the availability and access to COVID-19 vaccine. And even where the vaccine are available, there is delay in mobilization, mobilization of funding and activity to facilitate the uptake of the vaccine. Moreover, the narrow window of expiration requires a swift but well-planned intervention to optimize the eight-week period between vaccines. There is inadequate funding to support logistics for last mile distribution of vaccine and above all, vaccine hesitancy from the community members. These challenges with community health workers are expected, with these challenges, excuse me, community health workers are expected to be a major driver for vaccine distribution. We must therefore invest in community health workers to ensure the equitable distribution of vaccines to all with focus on vulnerable population. Trust is a key factor in the delivery and acceptance of COVID-19 vaccines and leveraging on the community health workforce can address this need. According to the John Hopkins University, new developed dashboard resistant vaccination includes fear about side effect and the desire to wait until more people have had the shot so that they know that it's safe and the lack of confidence in whether the vaccine really works. A strong and effective community health workforce is vital in addressing these fears and building community confidence. In conclusion, though Liberia had initial delay in vaccine uptake, but with, con with concentrated effort, momentum has gained in increasing, increased vaccine uptake and decreased wastage. Uptake amongst community health workers is high, particularly in areas with strong partner support. Barriers to vaccination include poor co coordination and planning, but above all, vaccine hesitancy. Technical and financial support for vaccine distribution is very critical. The trust of community health workers must make them a key stakeholders in increasing uptake amongst community members through community engagement and targeted counseling of community leaders with influence to achieve vaccine equity and co coverage to all, especially the voluntary and remote population, our approach must be targeted and intentional. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Villa, for sharing uh, lessons of experience from Liberia. Last but not least, we have one more speaker on this panel. I would like to call on uh, our Secretary General of Nigerian Red Cross, uh, Mr. Abubakar Kande. Mr. Secretary General, uh, please try to be brief. Um, uh, we have about a few minutes to, to close this panel. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Nina. Uh, Your Excellencies, uh, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen, kindly permit me to stand on the existing protocols. As mentioned previously, my colleagues, I think we have similar experience. I will only talk clearly to those probably that were not mentioned by uh, the previous speakers. Um, Nigerian society has uh, over 800,000 volunteers, and uh, we have engaged in the first and second phase of our interventions, uh, focusing uh, mostly on, uh, uh, I mean, we had uh, reached about 11 million persons with combined efforts. So, but coming back to the question here, the major challenges that uh, we have uh, regarding uh, the rollout of vaccine is the inadequate robust or program for awareness creation uh, for the vaccine rollout. Uh, in Nigeria, uh, there is no clear local language kind of program for reaching out to uh, the communities. Um, this is compounded by the insecurity and threat to safety of health workers uh, and also uh, the citizens generally. So for quite some time now, Nigeria has been a kind of uh, embedded by insecurity issues and uh, this has lower uh, the, 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 uh, I mean, the strategy for reaching out to most Nigerian citizens. Um, as also mentioned by my colleague from Kenya, I mean, Nigerians have been looking uh, to the government for an effective response to COVID-19 alongside other critical interventions, uh, such as uh, the issue of insecurity, uh, poverty, and also the other development challenges. So this has actually compounded the, uh, the issue of uh, reaching out uh, 
and vaccinating as many people as uh, been uh, kind of uh, desirable. Another issue also we have we share similarly with Kenya is the issue of the trust deficit. Um, many Nigerians, uh, particularly the poor, actually have uh, a kind of serious mistrust of the government uh, policies and strategies and interventions. Uh, a good example of what happened here in Nigeria, if you look at uh, the, if you look at the, sorry, I, I just uh, found that I, I was, the uh, video was closed. Yeah, if you look at the- Now we see you, thank you very much. Yes, I'm sorry, I didn't know, I thought it was open. Yeah, I just discovered that now. So, I mean, the NSAS project, for example, discovered many palliatives that were being sold by government, uh, illustrated of the lockdown that uh, has deprived many people actually of access to basic necessities. So only were discovered during the NSAS process. So that has further compounded the distrust, the trust of the uh, public authorities. So I go quickly to the, uh, I mean, opportunities that we have. Uh, there are quite a number of uh, community health workers and uh, volunteers actually preponderance in communities. And uh, like uh, my colleague mentioned previously, most of these actually are trained. They have been trained severally on several interventions. We just succeeded in coming out of polio uh, interruption, I mean, the transmission of polio, white polio virus. So if these volunteers and the health committee workers actually been engaged with simple uh, incentives and also guidelines, they can do a lot in ensuring the rollout of uh, uh, I mean, COVID-19 vaccination. Um, that can really help in a long way in kind of uh, uh, assessing. I mean, Nigeria has targeted, uh, I mean, uh, about 70 patients were taken up in uh, the end of 2022. But up to this moment, we are barely below 5% of coverage for COVID-19 vaccination. So, and uh, the key trust issue, I mean, that you mentioned, that we need to mention, is that uh, the key trust issue that you mentioned also is the issue of uh, distrust, I think that is actually one of the major challenge that we have here. We feel there is need to be more transparent uh, as far as uh, the vaccination is concerned. Uh, key stakeholders need to be taken fully on board. The issue of uh, salinistic operation actually should not be the case. As far as it's concerned, there are many uh, related issues to, to COVID-19 vaccination that can be integrated and also can be made more transparent in, the, in a manner that can really enhance the, the trust and confidence of community people uh, in Nigeria. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary General, for being uh, brief, uh, concise, uh, and sharing your lessons of experience from Nigeria. I would like now to ask um, Harold Brooks, uh, and it's a great pleasure, Harold, to, to have you on this panel. Um, Harold is a, a former Vice President of American Red Cross and currently Senior Advisor to IFRC on COVID. So if I can ask Harold uh, to summarize, help us wrap up uh, this panel with voices from, from communities. And thank you to all my panel members for excellent remarks. Uh, Harold, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Nina. I want to thank all of the panel members for a really excellent session and, um, you know, taking on the board, taking on board the challenges, opportunities and lessons learned and shared today are critical to ending the acute phase of this pandemic and applying these lessons to prevent the next one. The challenges raised today are similar to the challenges we face in my own country, the United States, issues of trust reaching the most vulnerable, including the homeless, socially distanced, and ensuring that communities are empowered and engaged are issues we at the American Red Cross are working very hard to address. Pandemics start and end at the community level. It's through, beg your pardon? Yeah. It is through empowered and engaged communities and the work of our community health workers and our volunteers that we will find a way out of this pandemic and prevent the next. Let's unite our actions so they speak louder than our words. I wanna thank each and every one of you panel members for very thoughtful contributions today. And now I'd like to turn it back over to Brother Itonde. It's all yours, sir, over. Thank you, Harold Brooks, uh, for these summaries of that specific panel. We'll now turn our attention, having heard the perspectives from leaders of national National societies across Africa, as well as voices from Ministry of Health and the distinguished uh, word of wisdom from Her Excellency President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, as well as colleagues from Africa CDC, 
We'll now turn our attention to hear a response from those community health worker perspectives from the international community and those aiding to, to shepherd a collective coherent approach. If I could encourage uh, those panelists to put on their cameras from WHO, UNICEF, the MasterCard Foundation and Gavi. And in doing so, I welcome, uh, if you would please put on your camera, I would welcome initial reflections, uh, welcome all uh, from uh, WHO. I understand that a colleague is representing Dr. Moetti. And in that capacity, sir, from the perspective of WHO, what should be done to ensure that governments of AU member states and humanitarian actors implement equitable and inclusive COVID-19 vaccine rollouts? Please, the floor is yours, WHO. And thank you very much. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here. My name is Benito Impuma. I'm the director of communicable and non-communicable diseases, representing uh, Dr. Moeti, who is not uh, available. So warm greeting, warm greetings to all of our partners and colleagues joining this important discussion. I'm very pleased to join you in sharing some experiences of the challenges opportunities and lessons learned in community engagement as part of the COVID-19 vaccine rollouts in African countries. Thank you to John for the invitation. Vaccine supply shortages remain the main hurdle to rolling out these life-saving products on the continent. Even within the African continent, we see that almost 60% of vaccines administered are in the top 10 wealthiest African countries, 28% in Morocco alone. Within countries, preliminary analysis by WHO indicates an emphasis on equity in national distribution. At least 30 African countries have rolled out vaccination in all districts, even in remote and rural areas. Women account for 42% of the doses administered possibly pointing to a need for more communication on the safety of COVID-19 vaccines for women intending to get pregnant and for those who are pregnant or breastfeeding. Globally, we've seen a tendency for wealthy people to be the first in line to get the vaccines. More analysis is needed to understand access to the vaccines across wealth quantiles and the actions that can be taken to address any disparities in access. We also think that more analysis should also be done to understand the extent to which marginalized groups like refugees or ethnic minorities are accessing vaccination in the region. To ensure no one is left behind, WHO is working with local and national authorities to engage different population groups as partners in planning and delivery of vaccination campaigns. In this, much has been learned from past campaigns for polio, Ebola, cholera, and other epidemic and pandemic prone diseases. We see time and again that bottom-up and grassroots approaches to community engagement work far better than mass one-size-fits-all campaigns. For instance, we've seen the importance of working through and building on existing networks, such as religious communities. In countries like Ghana and Sierra Leone, religious leaders have encouraged and mobilized their congregations to get vaccinated. Youth groups and women's groups are also very active and have well-established channels or ways of getting information to the people in their networks. Groups just such as the Red Cross and community health workers that we have worked with previously in response to other outbreaks such as Ebola have mobilized quickly. Going forward, as part of preparedness, more needs to be done regular, to regularly connect with these groups so that they understand in advance the roles they play in emergency response operations. We have seen this work well with the Red Cross and community health workers that we have worked with previously in response to other outbreaks such as Ebola. 
they have sprung into action quickly to support the COVID-19 response. More can be done too, to build the capacities of civil society groups and to build their interest in being part of the response and in promoting public health. To some extent, community groups are still an untapped resource. Authorities and partners can do more to support, engage, and empower them as part of improving population well being. We have also seen the values in places like Liberia and South Africa of setting up vaccination sites in places where people visit frequently, like churches, mosques banking facilities and markets, rather than setting up massive tents that may be away from the everyday commutes of most citizens. Bringing vaccination sites to close sites closer to where people congregate can make the decision to get vaccinated easier. At WHO, in the area of community engagement, we are working closely with government and partners such as the Red Cross and with local leaders and civil society groups. Together, we have mobilized more than 300,000 community health workers in African countries. WHO has also supported the training of more than 200,000 local leaders and influencers to share key public health messages with millions more people. To keep improving the rollouts, Countries are conducting interaction reviews, and these have highlighted good practices and lessons. One of the findings of these reviews is the importance of engaging service providers, especially health workers, as both recipient but also advocate of vaccine. Finally, a key frontier of the so-called COVID-19 infodemic of myths and disinformation around COVID-19, and in particular the vaccines, is social media and online spaces. To counter this, we have led partners in establishing the Africa Infodemic Response Alliance and Viral Facts Brands. These platforms help to understand the kind of misinforma misinformation that are circulating, and we then can develop targeted science-based information in response. So far, more than 200 information products have been produced, and these have been viewed over 100 million times. In closing, the control of outbreaks is, is won or lost at the local level. As WHO, we remain committed to working with governments, community, and partners to sustain and boost vaccine confidence and demand, and to have strong monitoring of the rollout to ensure no groups in our region are left behind. Thank you so much for your attention. Back to you, Chair. Thank you, Dr. Mpoma, for his insight remarks and commitments from the World Health Organization. We continue with this uh, the international perspective and hear from our colleague, Dr. Ade, regional uh, representative to the African Union of UNICEF. Dr. Ade, question to you. How can UNICEF support frontline community health workers, volunteers, and local actors in the vaccine rollout the strategy in the continent of Africa? Dr. Ade, please, if you would, the floor is yours. I encourage colleagues to keep their video on. Please, sir. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, um, uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Um, UNICEF is very pleased to be part of this panel and more generally to be part of the efforts to save lives and livelihoods in the fight against the COVID pandemic in Africa. Uh, Chair, you've heard a lot from previous speakers about the challenges that community because the view of unity to strengthen community health systems. This is because diseases happen in communities and at the local level, and the fact that the alternative is not sustainable. Mr. Chair, in response to your questions, I'd like to use the rest of my time to share some four additional messages and lessons that continue to shape um, UNICEF's contribution to the fight against the COVID pandemic 
in Africa. The, the, the first is that at 4% coverage um, of, of immunization, uh, the, 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 the levels, the immunization coverage against um, the COVID, COVID pandemic or COVID is very, very low in Africa. Uh, this means vaccines are needed urgently at scale and in communities. This is the only way we can harness the benefits of Unfortunately, doctor, please. Dr. Ade, I believe your line is poor, so I'm going to encourage you to turn off your video. And if we I get you, we'll... It's one of the ways that we can bring action to the community level. Okay, Dr. Ade, unfortunately, your line is unsteady. So we will need to proceed with the next uh, panelist. And in fact, he was touching on a crucial uh, point that I was hoping to hear further elucidated on and really pleased to, to further the discussion and hear from Ms. Rita Roy, President and CEO, the MasterCard Foundation. And Ms. Ms. Roy, an honor to be with you um, what can global funders do to help drive equitable COVID-19 vaccination in Africa? We know you're doing a lot and we're keen to hear from you directly. Ms. Roy, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Chair and esteemed colleagues. It's wonderful to be with all of you. Um, our message to global funders and to actors who steward significant resources remains the same. We know that there is no global security without regional health security and we cannot afford to sequence our response to the pandemic by geography. So throughout this pandemic, we've seen serious gaps in the global response, inequitable allocation and distribution of the tools and resources needed to keep everyone safe. And here in Africa, even in the face of these challenges, leaders mobilized. They created platforms, they created plans to purchase medical supplies, accelerate testing, roll out vaccinations, and now to manufacture vaccines on the continent. Africa CDC is calling for a new public health order rooted in equity and sustainability. At the foundation, we were inspired, inspired by this leadership to close gaps. So we got behind their efforts. And as you mentioned a moment ago, Chair, you know that today the MasterCard Foundation is deploying $1.3 billion in partnership with the Africa CDC to save lives and livelihoods. And we're doing this to achieve four things. Purchase vaccines for at least 50 million people as part of the work that Avat is doing. Enable the vaccination of millions and millions more, aided by logistics, delivery, administration, and the fine work that is being done by so many organizations, even those represented here today, to get to the grassroots. Third, to develop the workforce. That's so important in order to support vaccine manufacturing on this continent. And importantly, to strengthen the institution of the Africa CDC. Now, we were really intentional in partnering with the Africa CDC. Its track record was clear. Its importance as a public health agency of the African Union is clear. But our actions and our intentions run deeper. And I know many funders who might be listening will understand this. For any change to occur, for any change to be sustainable, strong, local, regional institutions must lead. And many already are leading. And our role as funders is to recognize this, listen, respect their mandate, their knowledge, their insight, and also recognize that by placing our resources behind their plans, they can scale their impact, they can scale their reach. This is so fundamental to shifting the current paradigm of how global development works. And that's why three years ago, the MasterCard Foundation committed to ensuring that 75% of our partners are African organizations. So if we truly believe in global equity, let's include everyone at the table to help shape decisions and get the right allocation of vaccines and medical supplies to the region's hardest hit. 
as funders, we can lead by example in driving equity. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Roy, for these clear and inspiring words. I cite strong local and regional institutions must take the lead as a really way of encapsulating the essence of this discussion. We continue in that spirit and we look to the CEO of Gavi, uh, Dr. Seth Berkeley, the Global Alliance for, for, for Vaccination. And, and we're, we're looking forward to hearing from you, sir, in light of all that has been said. How can we increase demand for COVID-19 vaccines and encourage community ownership and trust building initiatives? Dr. Berkeley, the floor is yours, sir. So uh, thank you, Atunde, and, and I also want to thank African CDC, the U.S. Mission to the African Union, and the International Federation of, of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies for this important follow-up uh, dialogue from the summit that occurred yesterday. Um, so let me just start to say that, that, that at Gavi, equity is the pivotal principle of our focus and underpins the drive actually to set up COVAX to ensure equitable access for COVID-19 vaccines around the globe, since we know in previous pandemics that did not happen. The first vaccine deliveries from COVAX to Africa began in February of 2021, and to date, more than 80 million doses have been delivered to 49 countries. Um, we expect this to continue. We expect to deliver by the end of the year around uh, 500 million doses to cover somewhere between 18 and 20 percent of the population with close to a billion doses by the end of the first quarter. And of course, we are trying to speed this up. But as you've heard from others, the coverage rates in Africa are very low, and um, this is completely unacceptable. And we need the voice of all the participants on this, and in particular on the supply challenges that still remain, the export bans that have occurred, the um, buying up of doses by wealthy countries and hoarding them, um, the manufacturing delays. So um, your question goes to this issue. As we're ramping up the COVID vaccines, um, we're seeing challenges on the demand side, um, um, including in some countries that really have um, only a small amount of doses. And um, as you would suspect, despite the risks of getting infected, many people do have questions and concerns around the, the vaccine. This is natural, not the least, as there's a lot of confusing information out there, including misinformation and disinformation. And just to say that if we think about this, vaccine hesitancy is an old problem in a new context. Um, COVID-19 has exposed and magnified the underlying social inequalities between and within countries, and misinformation is further widening that gap. So we've worked with the World Bank governments, WHO, UNICEF, and the Global Fund to assess country readiness for vaccine deployment in 128 low- and, and, and middle-income countries. While 85% of the countries participating in the assessments had developed national vaccine plans, only 27% had created social mobilization and public engagement strategy to encourage people to get vaccinated. And I, I think this is a really important point. In a world that's so digitally connected, many countries were caught off guard. They did not have the systems in place for social listening and engagement to counter online misinformation around vaccines, mainly due to limited experience and capacity in this relatively new field. They also lack demand systems more broadly, most notably a lack of expert staff at all levels to design and implement local evidence. So it's not a surprise that activities to generate demand were not included or sufficiently budgeted for in national plans. So just to say what we're doing about this, um, Gavi's work has focused on creating demand for routine vaccinations through a series of approaches that many other speakers have already talked about. Um, and I think what's important is this is about gathering local knowledge, building local country capacity, and deepening content engagements. So this is an important part of what we're trying to do, but we don't want it as a one-off. It has to be a strategic investment in strengthening the overall community health system, and as Arita has said, in strengthening the capacity of institutions on the ground. So a, a few other things that are happening. There's a demand hub that is working with existing institutions to try to help. 
There's also um, evidence that is being shared from country to country um, that's important to help people build on that experience. We're putting in about $800 million through our um, country delivery support. Um, early action money is flowing now. More will follow. We're also setting up some interesting new things. WHO has a program called EARS, Artificial Intelligence, Real-Time Online Social Listening of COVID-19 Conversations. Also, we've worked with Premise um, to work with eight countries in Africa to use technology to crowdsource a panel of smart uh, um, smartphone users, which isn't perfect because it doesn't you know, necessarily get to exactly the most vulnerable groups, but allows this to triangulate with social listening data. So lots of new ways are moving forward that can really make a difference. But we need the help of everybody on this call and beyond. We need a strong network of health advocates and community influences from grassroots to global levels who can be engaged and this misinformation is not a problem only in Africa. It's a problem in my own country, in the United States, and around the world. So we need to make sure that, that this movement for truth and honesty and data needs to happen everywhere in the world. So just to finish, it's critical that um, we make sure that this is a strategic investment in strengthening the community health system, not a one-off, um, that we work to use um, science-based, evidence-based innovations to increase this material and speed. And I think this is going to be one of the most important lessons of learning and action to come out of the pandemic, which will have an important legacy for routine immunization and other health innovations going forward. Thanks so much. Back to you, Mr. Chair. Dr. Berkeley, Thank you for these very clear words. And I take many of many things you've stated that the need to strengthen local knowledge and capacity, not as a one-off, but for the long-term to really enhance overall resilience. Now, as we conclude this panel, I'm mindful that one of our uh, colleagues and panelists here, Dr. Adai from UNICEF, a key partner in the vision you were articulating, Dr. Berkeley was not able to complete his remarks, but Dr. Adai, mindful of time, I would just simply say, if there was one key message you would wish uh, to convey, and then I'll need to conclude this panel. Dr. Adai, if there was one key message you wish to convey. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I apologize. Uh, things go wrong with the internet and others very often. Um, but, but, but our key message um, is that um, this is the time to strengthen our resolve, to strengthen community health system, because diseases happen in communities and the alternative is not sustainable. We need to come together to strengthen community health system. It's for, and it's for the long haul. Let me stop here. Um, over to you, Chair. Thank you, Dr. Dai. And it's precisely the word that we need to get across today, as Dr. Berkeley and others uh, indicated, that we have convened today, one day after the global summit convened by President Joe Biden of the United States, in an effort to draw further attention to the acute crisis facing the African continent. And I will, in this spirit, before handing over to the final remarks from Dr. John, Director for the Centers of Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and uh, Ambassador Jessica Le Pen, the US Ambassador to the African Union, I will simply reiterate that one of the central commissions, excuse me, commitments that the Secretary General of the IFRC conveyed yesterday. And he stated plainly that IFRC is committed to ending the pandemic and building stronger health security in partnership with all of you represented here today and those not present with us. Furthermore, and as I invite Dr. John and Ambassador Le Pen to turn on their videos for closing remarks, I would simply say that the IFRC is honored to work closely with the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And I highlight Dr. John as we have worked together on these four key areas, targeted testing uh, support to, to countries, member states of the African Union, risk communication and community engagement across the continent, strategic advocacy along these lines to ensure that voices are coming together and scaling up contact tracing where feasible. So I give the closing remarks first to Dr. John Ngenga Song, Director of the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, final word to Ambassador Jesse Le Pen of the United States. Dr. John, the floor is yours. Uh, 
I, I think um, um, the director had to step out uh, for another pressing engagement. So let me just uh, 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 say a few words on his behalf. Um, uh, first, um, we, we've seen the pessimism at the uh, end of the year, last year, when um, um, Africa was uh, nowhere when it comes to vaccination. But two events have really come to give us hope in Africa. Uh, to say that um, we we, are, we we may be beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel. The first one is the massive, massive investment in Africa's health security by the MasterCard Foundation that was launched um, just um, um, a few months ago. We are, that um, um, program is now being operationalized and uh, the, the outputs and the impact will, will be felt down the line as we begin to wrap up um, 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 vaccination on the continent. The second is what happened just yesterday where we had of uh, another half a billion uh, vaccines to, to come to uh, uh, some of the most needy uh, country from the White House yesterday. Uh, uh, and I mean, this uh, putting those two together, I think we might just begin to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And Africa may be able to really hit the, the target that is important because we all know that we have to get Africa to 60% uh, uh, level of uh, immunity uh, if we do not want um, uh, uh, incubation and, uh, um, and uh, other variants to rise up in, in Africa and then go back to the parts of the world. So we will all be safe once uh, everyone uh, uh, is safe from any part of the world. Thank you. And let me hand over to uh, Ambassador for her remarks. Thanks so much. Um, so we heard today directly from organizations who are working really tirelessly to coordinate and to execute the continent's response to the pandemic. We heard about how we promote vaccine confidence, expand testing, and encourage um, prevention measures that are going to help us to avoid lockdowns, um, all of which will, will um, shut off economic opportunities for cities, for countries. Really, how do we reduce the pandemic's economic impact. As I said at the outside, the United States is committing, committed to helping every country build back better. We'll work as a partner with really everyone whom I see on this screen today um, to address the global challenges. It's going to take the coordinated effort of all these organizations to expand manufacturing capabilities, support global distribution, and boost vaccine confidence. Um, and I'm, I'm really struck by what we heard from local organizations on that last point, just how important translating at the local level is for vaccine confidence. So um, we are allies in this fight, working together until the pandemic is defeated. We are committed to the goal of vaccinating 70% by 2022 and focused on making that happen by expanding manufacturers, by delivering vaccines on the continent and around the world. Um, crucial to that will be sustainable financing. Um, with that, I really want to just thank everyone. Let me in particular thank our keynote speaker, President Johnson Sirleaf, and enormous thanks um, to my partners in organizing today's discussion from IFRC and from Africa CDC, and to all of the speakers and panelists and moderators um, who really came in from across the continent uh, and beyond in order to to join this discussion. Thank you all very much. Okay, guys, it's right. Recording stopped.